a good I cheerleader. Like <laughs> the company meeting. <laughs> the NC. Alright, I believe we're live. Alrighty. So, I guess you start with the Regex one. Um. We were involved in it, right? Yeah. yeah, the issue is about adding two helper methods which either validates a given pattern with a given regex option enumeration um, or creates a regex object um, in a try in a try pattern style. The issue currently is that you can't create a regex object. Um, um, without catching exceptions for invalid patterns. Where are you reading the regex string from that it might be an invalid pattern? In the code you mean? Yes. Um, in the regex parser? Yeah, but I mean if it, generally regexes tend to be static literals in the code, so like what what would the behavior be if someone passes a bad static literal to the try parse method? Like it, it returns false, but what's the developer going to do? Because the developer is the one who put the bad const in there to begin with. This is not something you're doing in a tight loop or doing sort of extra validation. Or well, ge generally, when you have a try parse method, generally that means you're reading it from input where you don't know where the input came from. Yeah. But the regex class here here's my security hack going back on the regex class in particular is not meant for untrusted input. So where did the input come from that it might be invalid? Yeah. Um, the issue they discussed that scenario, especially um, if you, for example, store regex patterns in, in your database somewhere, yeah. mm -hmm. do something with that, um, which gets inserted by, by users, I don't know. Um, but at that point, your application is vulnerable to DOS. <laughs> like, uh, seriously, like if, where, where, what's the scenario where you're reading a regex where the regex is trustworthy but yeah. maybe invalid? There actually, there was someone replying with that. I asked exactly the same question. Yeah. Or not about trustworthiness, but if you scroll down at the bottom, uh, I have apps in the middle. We're starting databases, XML files, config files, external services, the Black Friday example ish thing is like. Yeah. Cool. But even still, what would you yeah. do? Yeah. If you hit one of these failed ones, you're gonna yeah. Apps gonna well, actually you're not gonna have a fallback to go to, right? So, so I guess you could argue for for one of those APIs for the validate API. Um, yeah, like have, having a validate API yeah. seems like it's goodness. And without without try, uh, without throwing errors, right? But I'm I'm just trying to think of the scenario where this would actually come in handy. And also, I would try pattern this for performance. Yeah. And I would argue. You're not going to be creating type like, projects. This yeah. is already so, like, regex is so slow that I don't think it matters. Well, it's not the regex itself, right? Like, the, you're not evaluating the regex. What? You're not evaluating the regex. You just. By parse, you are. Why wouldn't it be? Well, you're, you're processing the regex itself rather than well, doing the try parse you would, but like it's, yeah. not, it's not that, right? Like it's, it's it, try parse, you're not actually parsing the input, you're parsing the regex itself. It's not about the input, right? It's just about the pattern <coughs> yeah. and the options together. That's correct, but you are parsing the regex. Yes, but that's not, that's nowhere near as expensive as evaluating the regex. You, it does build up a pretty decent cache machine behind the scene, so. So the cost is static. Sure, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just pointing out that there's a difference between regex is slow, but when we say regex is slow, we usually mean evaluation of the regex, not the not the parsing of the regex pattern itself. Also, like I'm not, <coughs> I mean the validate method, as we guys uh, we just discussed, is n you know not so bad, but 
Like it returns a boolean. It would have and to be this like value. Actually, you know, in the exception, it can tell you like at this yeah. location in the yeah. string there was some you know syntax error or yeah. something. It kind of kind of can actually help you validate. It's like you know, I pass validate and it returns false. Like what do I do now? Now I actually call the non-validate method so it can give me some more information. Well, I think I think a decent example of where this API is useful is imagine an IDE, right? So you would like to have a scenario where, you know, we have a Rosin analyzer that is able to, or not even an analyzer, maybe even a VS integration, where basically we detect literals that are passed to the regex API, so we know this is a regex pattern, and we then can do syntax highlighting and, and, and other things with it, and we can also squiggle if it's invalid, right? You can only squiggle the entire pattern, though. You can't really, you need a much more in-depth parser to be able to... So, argue. no, I agree with that. Like, I mean, I, in a perfect world, you would actually return something that actually gives you more details about the regex, so you can actually say error occurred at position 15, right? And then you can yeah. actually squiggle that part of it. Um, but if you really want to do it, like, properly, like, you look at what Redprints has done, like, at some point, you just want to have code completion. At that point, you effectively re-implement what we have here. Like, you no longer use... Much more than what we have, actually. Yeah. The thing is, why why we designed the API like that is that the demand was to have a validation function with, which does not throw errors and does not come with all the burden of, of throwing exceptions here. But yeah, why? That's, that's generally only an interesting case scenario if you're worried about doing it in a sort of type loop performance-wise. Yeah. Also, like, I mean, let's look at this other thing from a just from a cube cost standpoint, right? Like. Like adding the APIs themselves cheap, actually having them API like having these APIs not throw exceptions under the covers, probably fairly expensive because we throw them right now left and right. Right, we have to actually go through our engine and say you know instead of this yeah. return this other thing and then bubble it up essentially, and that that seems like something where well is it worth it? Like I mean if the scenario isn't there to begin with. Do we have other cases where we need to validate something and either return true or false? Well, we we have try pars, but usually it's for <coughs> things that are called on user input in very tight loops. Yeah, like in try pars. Yeah. Because then you know yeah. performance can be actually. Well, for specifically, it's for primitive types like int, date, time, and so on. Yeah. And regex is not really a primitive type; it's a constructed type. Because otherwise, like, you know, we would be designing a framework, like an alternative mm -hmm. set of APIs that don't throw exceptions, which it, it never stops. Well, it depends on how you design the API. Though. I think it's reasonable to say regex, <coughs> and it would be an expensive feature, but I think it's a reasonable feature to say <coughs> regex would look more similar to Rosen in the sense where you have a... I don't know, a yeah. compile method that returns you a compilation result. And sure, the compilation sure. result has errors, it has the actual AST or whatever you wanna you wanna do with that, right? Yeah, I mean you are admitting that regex is a special case though because it's doing compilation under the covers. Right. Or oh. it, it may, maybe not proper compilation, but it is it is something that is intended to be parsed as if it were a language. Well I would say it's definitely a language, right? Like it's just a simple one, but yeah. I mean it's effectively instructions you wanna you want to execute one way or the other. We could, of course, just return a regex validation result, which is a struct which wraps error message into result, right? Even doing that, you it's going to require quite a lot of work in the engine to actually be able to get all that data out yeah. properly. So yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, this one doesn't seem like it's a very... But, you know, I, I see a scenario for validating patterns. So like that one I would agree with. I mean I would say like as I said, like IDE is a prime example, right? I mean like the, the fine and false dialogue would clearly benefit from you know more regex awareness and like squiggles and validation. But the question is, I don't think that feature gets us closer to that. Like what would get us closer to that is more exposing more data in the exception, for example, or you know, and, and that that one I think also needs more design and then also the question is well, we have a ton of cost to do that. Do we even know today if yeah. if the regex class tells you, or if the regex class even knows internally where the error is? Because I know that a lot of our parsers, including the ones that I've written, yeah, just don't. kind of do bulk validation, and all they really know is that somewhere in this chunk of yeah. text there was bad data, yeah. 
but it doesn't really bother drilling into where it was because, yeah. well, I'm just going to throw anyway, so why bother giving you... Up? I can answer that, yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, it throws, it always throws argument exceptions, but it, it exactly tells you what has happened. So there are a lot of different cases where it throws like 50 different argument exceptions, yeah. That's so really I don't even nice. have a regex exception, right? Like, you literally just give you all the freaking data in the text, which is yeah. amazing. So, like that. If I remember correctly, we, we have another Uber issue, or we've at least talked about it numerous times about rewriting the regex engine itself. That will right. kind of be folded into, all this stuff will be folded into that if we were going right. to do that. It seems it's more useful to, like, craft a new exception type, like, I don't know, regex validation exception or something that exposes that information in a strongly typed fashion so you can actually do something meaningful with the, with the positions and the, you know, the error codes or whatever, right? I mean, and at least, at least, like, you know, line or like I don't know, yeah. offset or something in the input. I understand that. That would be like I think significantly more useful than what we currently have. Would that belong in the system not regex class? I would basically, like what happens when we throw an exception, right? I mean, we cannot change the uh, exception we throw probably, but on the other hand, argument exception. Mm, it's also better be the exception. We can expression in there from argument yep. exception. Yep. <laughs> Just going to say that. But, oh boy, yeah, we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, I'm just taking a shower now. But yeah, that would work. We haven't yet decided if we want to rewrite um, the Regex engine completely and replace it with in a uh, place it in a new namespace, right? Or put it above the existing one. So it might still cons uh, is a concern for the existing API set of Regex. So it sounds like we have kind of an agreement that we don't see a lot of pet usage for these CPUs not in certain areas where it's actually going to be valuable enough to... Yeah. Yes. I think that's a reasonable thing. So then, I had to close it, but it seems like we're kind of agreeing that this is not a good or very useful API to begin with. We do make a new rejection, and we can think about this from the get-go and figure out how to plumb that through properly. Yeah. I think what would be useful for the new regex engine, like to design it for diagnostic purposes from the get go, like I think there would be value in having a regex analyzer in Rosen that would give you more details. Mm. The other thing that JetPrince has done, which I really like, was they have this thing called the regex, I don't know, evaluator or something, where you can invoke a dialog yeah. right from the from the from the point where you author them to actually test it out on like yeah. tests, uh, like to you know, have a UI effect with it that does it and like. I think all these things benefit a little bit more when we would expose more data. How do you currently know when you do an int try pass why it didn't pass successfully? The int is in valid format. There's only one condition. Okay, bad example, but different examples like UI dot try pass. I, I'm not sure if that exists. Uh, what do you mean by UI? UI. Oh, UI. UI. Try um, pass value well, exists. Oh no. Eight times that try parse would probably be the most complicated. But I think UI dot try parse does exist. I think. We can look it up easily. Um, yeah, daytime try pass returns a boolean. So you don't get any information what happens, right? Okay. For daytime, we, we generally we point people to use parse exact, which is they specify the format, and then it's a little bit clear whether or not it's matching that file or not. So your right does not have a try parse. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. oh, actually, yes, it does. <coughs> it's called try create instead of try parse. Oh, 
probably the largest one we have that's got a lot of parse mechanism is XML. XML parsing has a bunch of this. And it does have XML exceptions. It shows it. Doesn't try. There's an exception and it does have line uh, uh, column and line number information mm. from the based on the info. It shows a lot, of a lot of exception types, right, in XML. There's, there are a lot of exceptions, but I think the primary one when you're parsing it is there's an XML exception. XML syntax. Something along those lines. There's yeah. a, it's an XML specific exception. All right, what's the next one? We have two simple ones, so let's do them. Well, you know how it goes. Um, one is array pool 12644. There's just like, you know, ordering of arguments uh, deep at the bottom, like tweak to previous approval. You go to the bottom, please. We already approved this and we switched it back. At least I believe we approved it. Yes, we did. There was discussion about in which order the arguments should be. I don't think it was. I'm 100% sure that we decided that we want this ordering. Anyway, Dan flipped it to just like have one more discussion about it. So, well, we can shut it off. That decided. Oh, okay. Someone put the random example when there actually it's not according to our guidance. The problem is there is no order that it does not break one of the yep. one of the invariants. What do you mean? So these are the two overloads that we have, yes. right? Yes. So we can either decide to keep the current ordering and add the new parameter at the end. Yes. In which case it violates the other desired goal, which is that min becomes before max. Right? Well, so, like uh, we cannot have it both because max is currently the. Max is probably yeah. is currently the first argument, yeah. so we can only add it to the end. So yeah. uh, okay, I, I, yeah, I either screw one or the other. Like I mean, you have to pick. I think they need to be in order, otherwise, like because they are all the same type. If we start changing order of parameters, it will be just complete. I think the min max is kind of exception to that rule. Almost feels. Yeah. We need to be careful though. Like I mean, I remember argument exception. One of the argument exception has param name and message switched. I forgot which one it is, and it always fucks me over. And like this is another example where like we should be careful. Yeah, it doesn't make sense for men to be at the end. I mean, I would generally argue that an API that takes three ends is not the best design to begin with because it's not clear what any of them mean. Like, you know, array will create fifteen, twenty-five, one hundred five. Like, I have no idea what any of these pages. You know, we should wait till we have range type, and just add an overload that takes range. Well, I mean, today you can help yourself by just naming the arguments, right? Which is probably yeah. what I would do. Yeah. In which case, order is not even doesn't even matter. What? What? You can name the arguments yeah. on the call side. When you call the method. Sure. Which is what I would do because otherwise it's unreadable anyway. In which case, I don't care. Yeah, I'm just that. saying if we have a range type, it would solve both problems. It would be more readable and it would be hard to make a mistake by putting a third int in the, in the wrong place. The grass is always greener in the future. <laughs> That's a jelly choice. <laughs> Alright, so I would say like we just keep the current order. Like the, this What's the current order? Like basically add a new overload. So basically take this one and change, shovel it around. Like uh, I, I don't like it. Wait, so so you would literally not add the API. So well, would come I would add it at the end, the new parameter. That's what I mean. So I would I would take this one here. I know that it's weird, but 
And I will add it here. Is this an existing type? Yes. Look, it has to be this. I don't think anything else works. These are the two options we have. We like this one. It was introduced in one one at the area pool. Should we also consider making it the up the four parameter? Can't do that. Why? Well, because they already shipped these two APIs. You cannot default one there. No, no, no. But we can have the other, the other one. We can Actually, we but who? <laughs> the compiler would never match it, though. If you make this zero, like it's, it's sixteen by default, I think right now. But okay, fine. But yeah, but the compiler would never match it, though, because if you pass only two parameters, then the second, the second will get chosen. Right. The only thing you can communicate now what the default is. I mean, like that's. I was just trying to think about usually when you have default parameters, people typically use the primary names, which helps <laughs> lead them in the right direction. Yeah, you say that I don't buy that. So you know, another thing we could do, <coughs> um, we could create a small struct that is like a you know set of options for the buffer pool. Uh, it would avoid this problem. In addition. One of the big problems with array pool and the create method is that it tells you, you know, it tells you how many uh, arrays per bucket. But in a lot of scenarios, people don't want the same number of arrays for each bucket because they are using like one size, let's say like 4K. They want lots of arrays in the 4K bucket, but pretty much none in the rest or like lazily created. You're saying there's more policy to be added. So I think that people will be requesting more and more options. Would you not use multiple pools for that? Yeah, you would use multiple pools, but you, you somehow have to create them somehow. and configure them. You have to basically make the pool more flexible to allow for more inputs, in which case, I yeah, param struct seems better. I guess and the then it, you know, we basically would have a struct, it would have min length, max length, you know, some options about buckets and... I guess the question is, do you expect that we will add more more configurations, more parameters over time? So that's what I'm saying. I, I know of one okay. that is super, super useful. That it, the fact that we don't have it is actually a big problem. You know, like in a lot of cases, uh, like in networking scenarios, yeah. you would want to use a pool and majority of the buffers that you rent are quite large and they are the same size. And you don't today when you do that, we create a default pool, mm -hmm. and we I think we delay create the buckets. I now don't remember, but what once we create them, they have the same number of arrays in them. Uh, yet in the scenario that I described, you want you know a bucket 4K bucket with hundred pools or thousand pools, and other buckets with very small number of pools. Mm -hmm. What's the policy on potentially? changing a struct after it's already shipped. Is that allowed? Yes. Adding more things to it? Yes. As long as the struct is not used in pinvoke anywhere, we can change it? Cool, uh, we, I think we are even fine with that. We've never I, I just don't know if, if I've ever seen an example of us doing that before. That's why I asked. Oh, we have definitely added kids to struct to cool. um, The so, question is, yeah. how does the struct help you? Because you have to choose, and like if, you, if you make it a struct, you have to make it a mutable struct, otherwise it doesn't do what you think it does. But right? you have to be able to set properties on that struct. Otherwise you just have one really long constructor that takes a whole bunch of options, mm -hmm. in which case it's the same as this one. Yeah, but so why it has to be a mutable struct yeah. that takes it as a bunch of fields. Yeah. Which we generally don't do. No, we have a lot we of, a few of them. options. We Exactly, that's what we do. No, you, most of them are classes. Really? Yes. So we then basically then we don't make it a class, right? I don't care whether. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, you call it once, so like one allocation is not a big deal. Yes, I would agree with that. Uh, it seems to me. But I would make. I mean. Sure. I think it would be fine for it to be a strike, but class is good too. So that seems. Um, <coughs> RSA parameters is a mutable struct. It's meant for common or so that's why it's mutable. Uh, 
oh, there is another issue with with this API change. So a repl was shipped out of band and then added to the framework. Can we even add APIs to it? For .NET Core, yes. For .NET Standard, no. Not in the not in the OOP package, correct? That's right. So whoever, if we if we decide to change yeah. something here and somebody does the work, they they need to know about that. Yeah, you can mention it. Every pool all about reducing costs, reducing garbage collection, and then we introduce another class just for options, which is on the heap. Well, so I mean, you create one instance of it, so it's not a big yeah. deal. Yeah. But um, I wouldn't mind this being abstract either. I said that people feel, or emo feels, that class would be better. Well, it certainly is less error prone. I know that. We also need but to think about how. Sometimes that's a good, good comment that class can be mutated post creation as well, so that's a downside. Well, this, this, is, this would have to make a copy. Yeah, you, you would have to copy them as individual fields, but then. Um, the other consideration is how big gets the, the, the struct. Does it get bigger than 60 bytes, 16 bytes, for example? Yeah, but that's only really a concern if you pass this continuously back and forth. You know, it's similar to the why we would be fine with classes. You call this method once, so we're not calling this in a hot loop. Yeah. In this case, like the cost of copying would be fairly low. A frozen video, by the way, again. Yeah, like that's normal. Yeah. Um, and then it would add this guy, right? It would say. So should it be called array pool options or it's only about yeah uh, fine yeah because it may affect yeah. the runtime as well it's not just about the creation right yeah I like as I said like to me this is more like sketching it at this point. Span and the memo owned memory thin. Um. Is it so? We have another thing actually, is kind of we would like to get to that's the capacity dictionary capacity. Uh, is the read only memory whatever blocking something? Well, we have uh, like 10 days we want to finish all API changes. To this one is a high party bug though for Memis build, right? Yep, yep. they really want to start working on that. And okay, yeah. So let's. We can take a look at the second. I think we already were mostly done with that anyway. What was the problem with that? No. There's none, right? So then. You want to reuse the dictionaries and sh shrink them or resize them? Yeah, so I don't know enough about how many dictionaries implement this. So I don't know what the capacity controls. Because there's not the number of items for words, but the number of. Oh, hash buckets or something. Yeah, so you have no, a prime no, no. number. I think it's uh, it's actually the number of items before the thing will resize. It's called buckets, right? In dictionary. Yeah. yeah. So, so but if I have the let's take, look. the take capacity is a hundred, and I have a hundred items. Yeah. 
it doesn't mean that I'm... It's a, 100 is not working because it's not a prime number. It picks the next prime number. It's a hint, like at least this capacity, right? You yeah. know, that's a little bit less, or you know, are, are about this well, capacity. I'm, I, I'm not positive, mm. but I think capacity means how many items you can store without resizing. And yes, it needs larger sizes. It's, it's, it's data it's structures, a number of buckets. but it knows by how much larger it needs. Yeah, it's a number of buckets. It's a number of buckets. So as long as we know how to implement this, I have no problem with Well, the only thing is, <laughs> so yeah. it's we are adding setter. Is that the change? No, we're adding the property altogether. Well, yeah. it doesn't exist oh. at all. Okay. I Today see. you can only set it with the constructor. Um, so we got to see what the implications it might have on. Well, so dictionary. my question is, don't we have trim on dictionary? I'm pretty sure we don't. Well, if you okay, so if you set the capacity to one hundred and then you immediately <laughs> call the getter, it's not going to return one hundred. Yes. Yeah. Right. It returns the next prime number over 100. Well, no, 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 so this is not how I would design it. But it is currently that way, is that? No, no, but currently do we have a getter or we don't? We do no. not have a capacity. No. Yeah, so it's, it's not. just if a constructor where you pass yeah. capacity. So, yeah, so capacity is, the user is telling the API, I want to be able to store stock 100 items. Yeah, right. It's not the number of buckets, it's how many items they want to store. Right. The Buckets and the entries, which are the items, they need to align with the size. Yeah, it, it is a number of buckets in practice. Yeah. Current implementation, or implementation, implementation yeah. which is fine. I'm not. I I'm not sure if I if it's only an input parameter. It's not the number of. It's number of items that somebody wants to store. Which generally roughly equates to buckets. You don't want to have more than one entry in a bucket if you can avoid it. You don't want to have one. You don't want to have one more than one entry in a bucket if you can avoid it. Yeah, but the bucket is just basically right. like these are the things that have the same hash code. Exactly, but that depends on the hash code, right? Yeah. Which means you can you generally cannot accept it. Yeah. Agreed, but that's the idea. Is you you, can, right. you initialize the set. This is yeah. the flat list essentially. Yeah. So let's say I pass in a hundred. So I have a hundred buckets. That doesn't mean that I use all a hundred buckets and I store hundred items. Like right. all we know, they could all be in the same bucket. But, but no, no. But the thing is, we cannot have hundred buckets when you pass hundred because it has to be prime number. Right? Yeah. 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 We, so this is not the number of buckets. This is how many items the user wants to store. Well, that's why. That's why you said it was a hit. Different. So the next one is one hundred and one. Yeah. So so I think that when when the getter returns, it shouldn't return the number that now the array or the dictionary decided. It should return the same thing. It's basically the number of buckets that the user said they want to store. So it. So if you pass a hundred for the constructor, you're now getting a hundred back. In in the capacity property, right. correct? There's no capacity There's property. No property. Uh, say yeah. that we add it. Yes. Yeah. What, what do you want the behavior to be? If you pass 100 for the constructor, you get 100 back. Yeah. Does that mean we're now changing the serialization format of dictionary? <laughs> Why are we oh. changing? That plus what if we kind of decide to resize? So capacity because like if we like anywhere today. Lots of things. Right. We resize. We increase it. We, are we gonna still return 100? It doesn't make sense. <coughs> we're gonna tell like you know this is the capacity that currently it, this dictionary has. Well, I would so naively. What I would expect is the following: If you pass in a hundred, we return a hundred. We may we may use a hundred to get to the nearest prime number to allocate the underlying array to right. whatever that number is. We should not change capacity based on that. So dot dot which don't now don't means that yeah. the only thing capacity controls is when and if we resize, right? So here's a scenario: I have a dot net 4.5 application. Case, straightforward. I create a dictionary, pass in a hundred for the constructor parameter. I serialize that dictionary out to disk. I now have a four, eight, whatever application. I read in the dictionary. Right. I look at the capacity property. Yes. What does it return? Well, we would we would serialize it in the in the. It would be an optional field serialization. Exactly. Right. No, but I'm saying if you if you have an already serialized dictionary, one that was created with a prior version of the .NET framework, mm -hmm. yeah, and now in the new version you read the capacity. We we'll, we'll default it to probably whatever count is. Yeah. So one one thing that is weird is it would change when you serialize the serialize. Yes. If we wanted to avoid the change, we would have to have a field inside to store the value that is passed, which is kind of not We're very efficient. That anyway. So now my question would be, why do we even need this? Um, if if it's if the API if the scenario is to resize, we should just add the method trim. No, because they don't want to do it after the fact. Right? They want to avoid allocations. Then have a resize proper or field. We yeah, add the constructor parameter. It's now we don't need to store it. We that we just basically adjust it to whatever makes sense for this data structure, oh, and I we see. create 
when you serialize, it's not visible. Like you cannot read this value. Like we don't need to store it. We don't have problems. And then if you want to like trim, we have a method trim. That is true. It's just not what we do nowadays. But yes, that's uh, exactly what we do in other. Because we, I we, think we have lists of, like this is of TS capacity. That is, that is uh, that you can read and set. We don't have a trim method. We have a trim access method, which is some hand wavy stuff where we yeah. approximate how far we are from the, from capacity and then do something or not. Uh, you're saying so the scenario for setting which trim would not uh, support is I already have an instance of dictionary now I'm about to write 100 items uh, how do I prepare the dictionary so it doesn't have to uh, resize and rehash many times exactly um, does, so the, does the dictionary not have a method like add range or add multiple can you only add one item you can only time. add one at a time in the dictionary. There's no add range. And even if there's add range, sometimes you kind of you need to have then a collection of key value yeah. pairs. Like think of MS Build. They know very high on the stack that they're about to do something crazy, but they don't they don't want to change all the code that executes underneath yeah. it, right? Like that's and another point from Ben Adams that the setter would, is, will be too expensive because it's gonna likely have to reallocate and stuff. So yes. having it like a, as, a, as a setter is probably weird. Like so it should be methods a resizer and short capacity. And the method, resize. the method something like resize for trim. And then you don't have to have a property that gives you the size. That's I think better. To so so you would have a method resize and take or capacity. method is called in sure capacity or whatever. The good thing is we currently have benchmarks how costly that method is because we are currently working on that thing um, and it takes like one millisecond to resize to 100 million of buckets. I don't know what 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 the guidelines are. Well, probably it depends on what hardware and everything. Right. So right. The point is that people are already creating different dictionaries today just to work around the lack of this capa capability. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, so if you look if you look at the list of T, they basically do the opposite, where they only have a settable capacity. It's a gettable too. Well, it doesn't mean that it's gettable and settable, and then they have a trim access method. They don't have a method that takes a capacity, which is fine. I'm just pointing out, like yeah. we get we don't get consistency with this. But for array, if you set it, that's what you get. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. So this weird thing, you set the property to five, and then you read the property as seven. I mean, I I'm pretty sure that it violates the guidelines. Well, capacity is effectively underlying array, in which case that will be the same characteristic, except the underlying array happens to be a multiple of some prime number, right? It, it must be, yeah. And, and plus, you need to rehash on top of that. So. Yeah, it's, it's well, yeah, I guess that's fair. And if, if list of t is really large, resizing is also not cheap, right? So the argument that setting the capacity is not a True. cheap operation True. in any in anything. So. So um, we would basically say we would we would use the constructor, and we would have another method called Void resize and then it takes a capacity. Do we want it to be oh, and sure, capacity? And sure capacity. Yeah. Because, you know, for example, if you set resize to one and there's like only a thousand items, we're not gonna be dumb and put that's it to one. Fair, that's fair, that's fair, that's fair. You know, another thing we could do, the method could be not void, could return an int that tells you how many it actually chose to resize to. So you pass, you say resize 100, it returns you back 100 and whatever next prime number. What would you do with that information? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you can retrieve it, I mean. Um. You'd have to still decide what you do with it if you call it share capacity and you have, you pass a smaller value than you currently have data and all kinds of Yeah, what does that? Does it throw an exception or? Or does it end up like, yeah, fuck it, yeah. You probably have to throw an exception. Yeah, I guess. Actually, the, what you just said, I don't actually not sure it's true. The resize versus unsure? Yeah, I, sure? think that, I think honestly, I think talking to Dave, I think they won't be able to shrink as well. What are you gonna do, throw away things? You we You don't have bucket chains. We have, we have them inside the array. Yeah, but let's say you have an array that is like two million, right? Because no, you I mean, but, but you have two million items in there. You yes. cannot resize it to array of size one. No, let's say 
well, let me put it this way. You have, you have an underlying array that has, let's say, a size of 2 million. Mm -hmm. You store 10 elements in the entire array, right? So and re resize so 10 works. They never be lower than the number that then the, exactly. the, the exactly. yeah. so should it throw the resize or or should it just like ignore you? Like but if you say ensure capacity, the question is what's the contract of the method, right? You need to be able I to see, shrink in the line array. Two million is basically yeah. satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Count is a small thing yeah. you'll be able to exactly. So if you specify capacity lower than what current count is, you throw an exception and say you can't do that. But yeah. you have to be able to shrink. In which case it's kinda of resize, right? I don't like the throwing, honestly. Uh, well, what do you do? You just ignore it? Basically, yeah. So, like, you know, hey, resize to minimum, right? I mean, that's... I think that's reasonable, too. It's just depending on what you well, want. If you want to do that, you ensure capacity dictionary that count. They just uh, the minimum. Yeah, the, it, I mean, the, 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 the fix is trivial from the, from the caller side. I agree with that. I would probably just make it throw. Like, I... It yeah. seems straightforward. To be in a safe side with. Yeah, you wow. can you can always check and you can say min. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Well, max of my minimum and. Yeah, I, I don't like the fact that we have to sh look at the count, but given that it's fast, I don't care. Probably enough. Fair enough. If you, if you call it ensure capacity and pass it zero to try to shrink it, I I think that would be misleading if we just let that go by and. Then, we didn't do anything essentially because you already have some number of items in your dictionary. You, you're going no, to expect your well, I would you expect from tiny, uh, an empty dictionary after that. I would expect you know new path zero that we're gonna trim to minimum. No, but, but you just told me that you don't want anything. You want your dictionary to be size zero essentially. No, it just said make sure that it's large enough to hold at least zero elements. Well, <laughs> that's the ensure capacity and yeah. two million satisfies that unfortunately as well, but yeah, of course. You know. But how did your dictionary become two million in the first place unless you explicitly pass it as a parameter? Seriously. Or you added to two million. Or you added two million items, at which point, like, yes, of course. <laughs> like, it's never going to happen in practice. So you don't like the trim? Well, trim on dictionary trim always implies it's smaller, right? Like, what, what does trim mean on dictionary? Because once you rebucket everything, it's all going to be shifted around anyway. So what? Like, you can... You won't you size. Like, what, what's the resize from the perspective? How is it different than the floor? So, what's the reason why we can't have the property capacity? One, the, the biggest reason I've heard is that uh, it, it's going to do a lot of work for a setter. We have it on list. And what? We do the same on to list. To me, the main list argument is that it's not the property. And then you have to you set it, and right? then you read it, and it returns a different thing. That's a definition, yeah. anti definition yeah, of a true. property. That's true. So, here's what I would write. So we don't like the word trim because it suggests that I'm going to throw away some stuff? Well, because trim is weird if you want to make it larger. Yes. You don't call trim for if enough. you want to make the dictionary yeah. larger. Didn't anyone is going to use it for that? Okay. Most of our collections have an ensure capacity that's an internal private method. Yeah. yeah. And this dictionary is the only one that has a resize private method instead of ensure capacity for whatever reason. Well, but, all, but, but ensure capacity to me also implies it's it's never shrinking. Right. Yeah, maybe. Sure. So I think we should have a name that implies it can both so, you know, shrink and grow, which, I don't know, like, there's only one word that I can come up with, which is resize. Yeah, so we have some ensure, ensure capa capacity methods which just grow and not shrink. It's yeah. like math yeah. max. Yeah. That's pretty common. Well, Usually you're only growing most of these things. But yeah. What kind of exception do we want to throw? Argument? argument. <laughs> Probably argument or argument or something. But I think that's... I don't care so much which one of the two. Any concerns? Otherwise I would just comment and approve um, it. We already have the construct, right? Is it just for reference here? Yeah, that's existing, pre-existing. Oh, capacity you already have? Yeah. Yeah, that constructor exists. Either make a plus to the to the other one or remove it. So, one more comment. Um, the reason to return an int from resize is I call resize, I pass 100. 
Yes. How do I know when I need to call resize again? Hopefully, you should never be calling resize. What, why? Resize is just a hint, right? Like it never, it's never needed for correctness. Not for going. Yeah, but if I kind of want to optimize my code, I kind of, you know, like I do it in batches, and I want to. I don't want the dictionary to ever. Well, it's hard to tell. I mean, unless we give you like a, you know, a, some sort of uh, factor that basically indicates how we spread the items in the buckets. Well, it's hard to say so, because it's functional. So, functional I, I, if we return an int, I could implement the code that I want, which, which is, is basically I call resize 100. Yeah. I store the int that is returned, and before, you know, right before I enter, you know, add more items to the dictionary than the int that was returned, I call resize again. With Why would you do that? Because then I control the resizing. It yeah. doesn't happen yeah, for me. You you shouldn't use it if it's just about that, that, that little range. You would use it if you want to grow it to like two million from from ten items, but not just for to the next prime yeah, number. Probably going to be snapped to the higher version. That's anyways. exactly what I want to avoid. I basically don't want dictionary to ever like for me choose some next small I increment. I basically monitor how many items I already added, and right before it's, it resizes. I would resize it to whatever I want. But at that point, aren't you, aren't you potentially working around any type of like amortization optimization the dictionary might have under the covers? Because if you do this exact same thing with list, you end up having ov and squared operations. Whereas if you let it do its regular double behavior, you end up amortized o of m. Well, I can I can control it however I want. Why is it o n squared if I do it? Uh, if you're growing the list linearly rather than exponentially. Oh, but I wouldn't grow it linearly. Who said that I would grow it? Oh. That then why not just rely on the underlying dictionary behavior well, to do the well, right thing? Maybe I want that he knows the when, he's, when he's adding growth. a ton of items, right? Yeah. So if you, if you know you're about to add 10,000 items, yeah. and you know the current size of the dictionary, you can also of the of the of list of t, for example. Um, it, yeah, you basically end up with a world where you but you effectively, like the underlying dictionary, sorry, the underlying list of T may grow like five times, but because you know you're doing this 10,000 thing, you only grow it once. Well, then you, 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 you resize the 10,000. You don't resize to the, the old value that was uh, passed. Well, except that in dictionary, it's more complicated because it's not 10,000. It's like it's like some higher number based on... No, you, you resize to dictionary.count plus 10,000. Yep. Um, I guess that's true. If you're gonna add ten thousand, yeah. and the same thing, if you know that you removed a bunch of stuff, you say like, you know what? Hey, resize to count. Yeah. Or I want to have buffers resize to two times count or something. Yeah. What we use the number for? Like, how we use the return? That's what, that's what I say. I don't want. It. Let's say I never want dictionary to choose the size for me. I always want to choose it myself. Well, I get that, but how do you how do you use the return value from resize? Like, what do you do with that number? I store it. Yes. And right before I add an item, I check whether I'm approaching the threshold, and then I resize to whatever I want, not to what dictionary. Well, what do you think the number returns? So basically, you, let's say you pass in resize 10,000, yeah. and then we would return 10,000 plus some number that is basically the nearest prime number of 10,000, yes. right? Yes. How is this different from you just monitoring the 10,000? Because I don't know what the uh, adjustment algorithm is for small numbers. It's probably the delta is very small before between what I pass and what I get back. For very large numbers, prime numbers get rarer and rarer, mm -hmm. and I get very large slug. Mm -hmm. So imagine that I want to create a dictionary where I control how it resizes. Because today it's kind of out outside of my control. Yeah. So I would wrap a dictionary, add a method add add a field that says I'm approaching capacity. In add, I ch just check the field, and then, then I use whatever algorithm I want to resize. Otherwise, I cannot... It's still going to be uh, snapped to the nearest prime number, though. So you're going to... Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. But I still, like, I control, you know, maybe I don't want uh, doubling the size. Maybe I want uh, four times the size. Well, I can implement it with it. So now yeah. the question so is, what is the cost... Why would we not return oh, the same? measure approaching that number, though? Because, I mean, you don't know what dictionary underlying does, right? So, like, let's say let's say we get to 90% of what the, the current capacity prime number ends up being, right? You may measure to 95, so your code basically executes after we've already grown the size. No, no, no. The, the number that is returned is the number of maximum numbers, uh, maximum items that I will be able to add. But it doesn't give you the maximum number of items before we grow. You know, yeah. 
Yeah. That, that's that's what I thought. Okay, so let's say let's say you pass in ten thousand, and we let's say the nearest prime number is let's ignore math is twelve thousand, right? Maybe then twelve thousand. So that means we may no, we may decide to resize at ten thousand five hundred. How do you know which number you need to monitor to call resize before we do the resizing for you? The number that was returned. But that's not the number we, we yeah, use. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the number that I'm proposing we return. So it, but that's what I'm saying. So you okay. basically propose the number that we return is when we would grow next. Correct. Hmm. But what if it de doesn't depend only on number of items, or if it depends, like, you know, how many collisions I have in the longest chain or something like that? Like, yes, it does. we're suddenly <laughs> digging into the deep dive of the implementation of the dictionary. I don't yeah. like exposing that type of stuff. Honestly. Like, so if we it's want. It's impossible. Like, maybe that's something. Like, Mac, you know. Having getter max capacity or capacity, which is like, you know, hey, th this is the size of the underlying array. I don't want it. Right. Sure, I'm fine with that, but it doesn't tell you when the dictionary is going to resize. Yeah, okay, fine. I, I buy the argument that sometimes it's not known at the resize time. So if we want to implement the scenario that I was talking about, we just have a protected member that gives, you know, like creates the next capacity. I, I think your scenario can actually be accomplished. Uh, just by using the regular count property. Because what you would do is you would say, I say that the current count is 10,000. I want to add 5,000 items. You would call resize 20,000 because you, or in your case, 40,000 because you want to do a 4x growth. No, it wouldn't accomplish it because it would be, um, I potentially would resize when I didn't have to. Because I call, I call it with, you know, uh, 100. Yeah. Then I resize when I'm about to add number, I mean item 101. It resizes, but it didn't have to because there was a slug. And then I never add any more items. So now I just resized one more time than I could. But it's fine. Okay, fine. I buy the argument that like we don't know this number yeah. that is useful when we call resize. It's a collision count and we can't predict yeah. it before. I think Ben is missing the point that we don't want to store the capacity at all because that forces us to change realization. The, thing, the question is how he thinks about it. Is it the capacity that we passed in or is it the capacity that is really under underlying thing? Well, that's yeah. also the problem. I mean, yeah. the, I mean, I think if it's a different thing, like generally speaking, when I say new dictionary of 500 and capacity doesn't return 500, something is fundamental. I told him that we don't, we don't see the need for the capacity together and he's okay with that on IAM, so we're good. Also, this thing doesn't actually allow us to shrink or grow. Um, so approved? I guess it's approved with the new shape, yeah. Let me actually go. Um, just for reference, the capacity property would not harm serialization at all with a getter. Why not? It, it, it's not that it harms serialization because it, it would be optional, but the thing is, I. No, I wouldn't add it to a serialization block at all. Then this means that once I round trip a dictionary, some of its properties change, which is weird. No, no. Um, the or the capacity would change. Yeah. The capacity always existed, right? It's the length of the array. No, because as you said, like we pass in ten thousand, you pass in ten thousand, yeah. you want it up to the nearest five. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that paints you changing That's it. Count, yeah. 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 And I mean, it wouldn't be reasonable for us to throw when you don't pass in the prime number. That would be very weird. Yeah. <laughs> we do that in some places, actually. Well, no, not prime number, not multiples of two. But e even yeah, the, the underlying dictionary yeah, class doesn't even like use power. every prime <laughs> number. <laughs> so. I comment about the exceptions. Well, the problem is, yeah, that, that doesn't work either for the same reason. Grow or shrink capacity seems like a long method there. Yeah. Well, if you're coming from a C background, this is actually a good point. Resizes the number of actual elements. True, but we have count for that. I don't know. I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, to me, it's more important that we're self consistent. With, I mean, I don't. It's probably true that size is uh, not the best word, but rebucketize. <laughs> I don't know. It's Redo. Called, Redo. Called resize in the. Uh, in the right. We have the conflict. Do we want to schedule another one hour uh, to f to move the um, span APIs if we need them for the next ten days? Well, um, them offline or something. I, I would like to do them as soon as possible, so let's let's keep going. I'll be late to this next meeting. The next meeting is the staff meeting. Uh, where's I? Aren't you going there? I am. Yeah. 
It starts now, correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, but I, I'm willing to stay here. Willing to not move? I mean, we can continue. I'm no, let, uh, let's continue okay. for uh, five minutes. Plus, keep notes for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> or ping me if there's something super important. Capacity is the size of the underlying capacity, not the size. Add items will be the size of change. I'm not sure what he means by that. <laughs> yeah, the underlying the underlying capacity is the size of the array, right? Yes. Yeah. So, well, so he talks about count, right? He's replying to Dan, right? Yep. Oh, yeah, I guess that's... So I wonder if recess is the best word. Uh, we're not going to solve it probably right now. Uh, we will see if the discussion kind of continues on the issue to be heated. We can bring it back. Let me put it this way. I, I think I know what the API is, but somebody... Looks like the API needs more discussion. No. All right. Set capacity. We have design discussion for that. So then, so what is your thing, Christophe? Uh, there are two. One is a uh, read-only span of the dangerous get pinnable reference should return read-only reference. This one. Okay. That one, and then this one for where? Right? And or no, th well, the other one that is important is the change on memory pin to take optional integer offset. Then just get pinnable reference should return a read-only reference. Um, oh. <laughs> as long as the compiler people are okay with it. Can you scroll? There are comments. There it says agree. That argument from Barry from Jared, I don't buy because, you know, the method is literally called dangerous get pinnable reference. So we already gave up on that, I think. <laughs> Can a ref t be passed uh, to, to a, a function that takes a ref read only of t? I assume it Yes. Can. Okay. So, yeah, I, I think there's no downside in doing read only here. You can only use it in more places. A few of places, sorry. But it's all the right ones. And now we have a method to cast it away. Can you cast read only ref to ref? Memory. Not span. No, I mean, like, uh, if I have a ref, like an actual ref, oh. is there any way to cast it away? I think there is, right? Didn't we add one? Isn't there, like, an unsafe method where I can cast it away? We could add one if one doesn't exist. I'm pretty fucking certain that we have that. Uh, I mean, I may be wrong. That's when I don't know English. Uh, that's the one. Where, where would it be? Unsafe. Unsafe. That's right. And that's in system, runtime, other services. Other services. Yes, that's one of those guys. Yeah, it renders incorrectly, but it takes a read only ref and gives you a ref. So we got that. Can we add read only or ref methods to unsafe? All read only is just going to follow an unsafe code. What happens if you pin a read only ref? You get the pointer. Yeah. But it's a regular writable pointer, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. But it, then you're in unsafe code. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah once you have a pointer, we, we technically don't care. Although, sure. like, do we, is there even such a thing as a, I guess it's a cons pointer in C, right? No, I, f I forgot. Like, there's cons pointers and there's pointers or to pointer cons. Pointer to const. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Like, I, it depends on where you put the fucking cons keyword. <laughs> uh, we can. 
I got shit that's in the I got a negative menu. Yeah. Let me, let me put it this way, like, yeah. my, my care level is, is pretty minor. It looks like a good addition, but I don't have a lot of experience with this. Like, I mean, I would defer to you and Jared because you worked in a system that had pretty strict read-onlyness. Jan claims it creates stutter, I don't know. Like okay, maybe that's so if you can write this at the end of the, uh, yeah. of this thread, basically say whatever Jan, Christoph, and compiler people want. Keep in mind, this API is already hidden from IntelliSense. Yeah, it's actually being, I think, moved to unsafe, if I remember correctly. Is it first compatible reference? Okay, so it takes... I see, so it's no longer a method hanging off of span. It's going to take a span as a parameter. I think so. I'm not absolutely sure. But the point is that the compiler people are working on a syntax yeah. to be able to just pin spans. At which point you don't ever need to call this API, right? Or almost never. Oh, fine. Yeah, there are reasons to call it, but much less than today. I mean, we call it in our perf sensitive code, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. This is not really like an API design issue. It's like... Why is my calendar not updating? So Jan is not pushing back, he's just calling out it's going to be difficult. Uh, Jan is not pushing back against the idea. He's just calling out it's going to be expensive. What? How is it going to be expensive? All to change everything, all the places, and he, you know, he suggested this plan of staging it. Yeah, expensive work-wise. Yeah. Sorry, that's what I meant. No, I got that. I'm just wondering that whether we, why we have to touch that many places. Um, because it's already used in so many places in other repos and things, so. Breaking int a little bit is eh, yuck. So it just bounces it back as API needs to work. Like somebody else has to make a decision here. Like fine, fine, fine. I'm not inclined to dictate one. Right. Let's let's all memory pin to take an optional integer offset. So basically, what happened is we removed this offset from pin based on some discussions. I don't know what they were. It broke ASP.NET very late in before they were shipping SignalR. Ason hacked it. I forgot how by changing memory handle to be mutable and being able to adjust the offset, something like this. And basically the bright fix is to add this API back. Yeah, I have no problems with that. I, I mean can we actually do it the way it's suggested, meaning an optional one? Or do we have to introduce a new overload? Uh, yeah it can be optional. If it's not too late to change that, then I don't care. No, we, uh, otherwise, we basically, we have a, a bit of a hack, plus you cannot use owned memory uh, directly in the same way that memory of T is using it. So memory of T basically has access to the internals of memory handle and just adjusts it. Adjusts it. Uh, but like, if a third party wants to write something else that uses owned memory, not memory of T, the, then they basically cannot adjust the pointer. So the thing is, imagine that you write something yourself, like memory of T. It wraps owned memory, but it represents a window, like a small segment of, of the memory. When you call pin, you're going to get pointer to the beginning of the buffer, not the to the beginning of the window that you represent. It it's break it encapsulation, basically. Right. And basically, Ason fixed it by adjusting the pointer inside on memory because they are in the same assembly, on memory and, and memory of T. What about the other span ones? Um, so this one, like this one, this one, 
Spe yeah, this one's. Uh, this as vector, I think we should punch. We just don't have time to do it. Okay. Yeah, let's let's just immediately. You can even like find, change the milestone to one point. Uh, two point two. Future. So to say, I don't think there's a two point two. Especially that it can be done manually. You don't need the API. Um, Yeah, so this is like Steve Toop complained about this a lot, and I, I agree with him. So long time ago, we decided that you, if you have like a, you know, a different type than span, like mm -hmm. string, first you have to, and then you slice it using the slice APIs on span, right? And it's super verbose and it looks really bad, so. People would want something directly on string, like string that, you know, slice would be better, but, you know, as read only span seems to be a good compromise. So I tend to agree with you. I think when we, when we talked about this thing, originally there was this idea that we would introduce string segment and use array segment more frequently and would maybe use slice methods on segments as well, which I think we have largely given up on. In which case, the guidance to, you know, a call within the a type universe and then you can slice within that, it seems like that universe is only span, so you might as well just have the methods directly on the off the type. In which case, I have no problems with that. So, actually, you know, now that we support, so before, we only supported uh, spans of, over a string. Now we support both span and memory. I actually don't see a difference between your string segment and read-only memory of char. It's it's the same thing. It's heapable type, and it represents a segment of a string. Yeah. Uh, that was the yeah. That was yeah. the whole discussion that we had offline. I think over email at some point where it's like, well, the string segment actually yeah. at any value. Yeah. So at this point, like honestly, I would even prefer to call these methods. Maybe slice, I don't know. But it's, they are, my problem is they are already, they are even long here. Like it used to be very long and busy. Now it's as read only memory. Yeah. The only problem I have with slice, and this is a minor issue, honestly, is say that, say that you have existing, well, say that you're writing code where you want to start reading from the, fir the second character of the string. You skip one character. So you do string dot slice one, basically. Now, oh, I actually need to change that. I need to pass in the entire string as a span rather than just everything after the first character. Now, instead of slice one, I delete that and call dot as read only span, which is a bit weird that I'm calling a different method name to do effectively the same work. Minor issue. I could always call slice zero. I was about to say like that. You can do yeah. that, right? Which is the most straightforward yeah. thing. I mean, yeah. yeah. Personally, I can go with either one of them. I, ca the I can live with that one as well. Like, I mean, that seems. The only thing is that so only one of them can be called slice. That's, you know. What? Only one of the yeah. pairs can you, be called yeah. slice. Yeah. The other one. Both can more and span, right? Well, you could call it with only slice, but yeah. Well, both of them are read only. Um, yeah. One is spam, one is memory. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's true. Yes, yeah, so Jan is here. You can do that. So, w w what would we call them? In that case, in that case, I would I would say this is probably the most sensible yeah. thing. The the one that three times read only memory. No, I mean I would say like instead of doing oh, slice, I, I would they would go with this because that doesn't have the ambiguity. It's pretty clear what you what you get. Would you be able to remove the read-only parts of those methods just to make them a little shorter? So it would be as span and as memory? I would do it, but but at the same time, I don't think, I mean, the, but it's, it's, it's clear on string, you could argue, because yeah. it's only read-only on string, but we have so many other places that we do as span and as read-only span that it seems just for pure consistency, we should probably stick with the read-only. Okay, that's, that's right. It's just, these are very common, and the names are so long. 
So what, what, what about to make it longer? Slice as read-only span. Slice as read-only memory. And until it sense it's going to show you know, up, and I'm just going to pick which one. Of the we could call it that. slices memory, slices span. Or without the read-only. It's not an option. Seems like a minor optimization to me. I, I'd rather seek to consist in nomenclature than optimizing sex keystrokes, given that you auto completed anyway. Oh, the as read only span it. Yeah. I mean, honestly, the only thing you have to type for the studio is AROS or AROS. Would we do the same thing to array? Have uh, as span or to span that takes arguments? I would say yes. What do we do on array to take this? We don't have those same issues. Yeah. yeah, I would say that also. Sure. That seems also reasonable. So, do we have do we have an as read only span on strength today? Mm, no, we have as span. As span. No, no, no. Sorry, no, no. You're right. We have as read only span. Yes. Okay. Without you, without, without arguments. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So this yeah. is doing on top of that slicing. Yeah, yeah. That's actually pretty consistent with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, even though it does slicing as well, but you know. <laughs> well, you say that, but like when we talked about this originally, we said the problem is you want to reserve slice for a different terminology than getting a span out of it. And originally, the idea was you have a method that brings you into a type universe in which you can do slicing. So basically, yep. you would take a string and you would either create a string segment or you would create a span. Array, same thing. You would either convert the array into an array segment or you would convert it into a span. And then both array segment and string segment would have slice methods, and the other one would have the same thing. And then the the I don't know why we concluded that whatever name brings you the new time universe doesn't allow slicing at the same step because it would still be consistent with that. I forgot there was some debate we had, and we decided that that's the that's the way we want to go. Um, well, I think it was because the methods were called slice initially, and then we decided to call them as, and then as is kind of weird that it takes parameters, and like, I, I think it was a bit of hair splitting, and in fact, one of the things that I really don't like about the current APIs is that we keep putting the read only into like these methods. So here's one, one more time, my pitch. There are types, they are either naturally read write or naturally read only. We should just have a method as span as memory, and they return the thing that naturally corresponds to whatever they are. If they are read-write, then we have implicit cast from read-write span to read-only span, and from read-write memory to read-only memory. And, you know, like, we would not have those very long names that add read-only to the name, and it doesn't add any value. I, I agree with Christoph's assessment there. Like, it's... So I have no problems with doing that. I... I I just think we should do it consistently across the board then. Correct. I have no problem with and it's that. It's already consistent because the only type that is naturally read only is string. Yeah. Otherwise, you so know, on array we have as, as span because, well, it's read write. If the methods already exist, I would say it's more consistent to use those instead of. So in, uh, to use the same return type as they do. So those methods already exist, right? As no, you said, only the as read only span, and we just added it recently, yeah. so we can change it. I see. One oh. method exists that basically doesn't take any parameters, but we can still change it. So is okay. that is that the only method that has read only in the name? No, I think so. Because the only type that we have that is like this is oh okay. There's also. Yeah, on arrays you have as read only span as well. That's the only way you can get a read only span from array, otherwise you would always get the mutable version of it. Right? Well, but then that's what I'm saying. That's a this S span. And you can then implicitly cast to read only span. If you want to optimize it, you call the method that has no special name because it's like an optimization. So I, I hear what you're saying. It's not something that we haven't done in in other areas though. Like in like usually we say as you specify the type name you get back. Like that's usually what you do. I mean, like, for example, like take take immutable collections. We don't have as list 
and say, well, if it's an immutable array, you get an immutable list. It's fine. Like it's, we try to stick to like make the names consistent with the type names. I, I'm not sure if there's a value because basically we don't repeat type names in all names of properties and APIs. Like we don't have methods that are called you know create and then it also like we follow with the name of the type that we create well, as, we we, as we do. For us, we do. We name we name a case that we didn't. Like I'm not aware of methods create that doesn't take anything well, as. as. No, no, no. I, I agree. Yeah. Well, and as is supposed to give you a different view into the same object generally. Yes. So it needs kind of what I'm going to look at, right? Yeah. I mean, what is fair is we have as read only, which, depending on which type you're on, gives you different representations of a read only wrapper. So, read only dictionary, I think we have, and we have read only collection. But, yeah, I don't know. To me, it seems like a minor optimization just for the sake of saving keystrokes, which I'm generally not a fan of. Um, Would it? make more sense if we could somehow have an implicit cast from string to read only span of char? I believe we already have that. have that, yeah. Oh, yes. all right. Stephen did that. I'm apparently really behind the times. Oh, uh, you know, it's like one week, one week old, so... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just that I think the ass ones are usually easier to deal with. Well, you basically, if you want to create a slice of string, you would have to manually cast it, and then you can slice. Yeah. Yes. Or call yes. one of these overloads, yeah. Yeah, in which case the overloads are usually easier to call. Yeah. So, regardless of this one, like I think the proposal is about this one, right? the proposal is really about adding these overloads here. You're yeah. proposing a different thing, which is renaming these things, which... Okay, fine, fine, fine. Let's treat it separately. And I think I would say that within this thing, I, I think there's nothing... I would, the only thing I would add is... We We have a uh, little bit back. We have as well extension method as read only span on array segment. Do we want Sorry. Yeah. memory as read only memory on array segment? Yeah. yeah which one are you looking at? Um, I'm looking at uh, ASPISOF.net. So it's back to the issue. Yeah. Uh, looking at the consistency, we just added the sure. as read only uh, span. So that's something that we might guys want to kind of look, you know, on the consistency of all yeah. the types. An extension methods, probably. Yeah, that makes sense. You just added array, and maybe array segment is another example, or maybe not, I don't know. So we have sequence equals, and people want sequence compared. Okay. The compare spans. No problem with that. I think it's reasonable to me. Why not introduce an actual proper I equality or I compare? Uh, what would you call the I compare it on? Like what? No, as in you have, you have a class that implements I compare of span of byte and read only span yeah, of byte, and then it has a dot compare. But you span in generic argument. Yes. Uh, By good thinking. Yes. That, I, I'm pretty sure this will eventually annoy the living shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for delegates. This is going to be painful. Did we do the generic? Right. No pun intended, but we have the funks that effectively take spans. Did we add one? Correct. Oh, how did we call it? Funk span? Span fun? Something like this. Oh, God, yeah. Fun span? Yeah. yeah, it seems like consistent with the other one that we already have. Like, I. I and then you would also have one that takes memory, just for consistency. I don't think we did this. I think we generally said when you want to do any operations, you have to get a span out of it okay. first. Sure. I believe that's true. 
Make sense? Um, someone sent me this. Yay. I think I may have found it. Yeah, we moved up for grabs. Uh, don't worry about that. I just added it back. There's only a handful of people who will jump on those things. Oh, no, it says at the end, I removed it and I added it. Yeah, it's like awesome. Good job, you're very smart. Um, Fucking confident we tried to do this in the past and it didn't work. By the way, that API already exists, the one that we just looked at. Which one? Uh, it exists in system buffers primitives. Yeah, it, but it's about adding it to code effects. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, the name's different. It's compare to, not compare, just FYI. Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I think the, the compare to it, it's sequence compare to, just for because all of the other comparison methods are named compare to that is rather than just compare. That's actually it's, it's no, well, no, no, no. I think the reason is because initially it was an extension method. Uh, yes, at the moment in system buffers primitives, it's implemented as an extension method. Well, it would have to be. So it can, it, it, it cannot be called compare to if it's not an extension method. It will read very strange. It, it is an extension method. He says that it is extension methods and over here as well. Yeah. Like, this is an extension method, clearly, right? Okay. So it's it's first dot com com sequence compared to second. Yeah, as opposed to sequence yes. compared. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, that's what I kind of meant. If it's an extension method, it can be called compared to. If it's yes. not, then it cannot. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't mean the context which you moved on. I'm no, sorry. no, no, like, that's an actually good point. So if you call it without extension method oh. syntax, it's weird. Nemo, are you on mute? I couldn't hear you. Often. That is very plausible because you are the only one online. Oh. <laughs> no, we have ban. No, I mean like on, on Skype. Oh, I see. Um, I you just yes. watched the you know yeah, live, yeah, yeah. live on when YouTube, so. <laughs> um. Right, so happy with that. Yeah, it probably would have helped. It's sharp. Syntax on white. All right. So when we edit read only list, I believe we looked at string. I don't know why we didn't do it. I think one of the rationales was you only looked at types that implement I list, and string didn't implement I list. I think that's why we didn't do it. To me, the question at this point is like, what's the value of doing that? Uh, there was actually something from Paul Herring. Herring uh, discussed. No, he just suggested to count. No, 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 yeah. This is actually one year old. He did some VS digging, or for digging. Honestly, given that we now have span, like I really doubt that this is any area any value. Mm -hmm. <coughs> he wanted ice string, yeah. And we definitely do not have ice string. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he wanted, so. Yeah. Well, they, I know why they wanted it, but they, what they want is a very different thing. They want to have an abstraction uh, so they can unify VS text buffers with. Uh, oh, he wanted actually for Roslyn, so. Yeah, that's what, yeah, because it wasn't wraps VS text buffers. But they basically solved it by adding source text. So, I think, <coughs> which is not horrible. Honestly, I would I would go with let's reject it for now. 
pronounce? Like, you know, let's let's ask Paul what he thinks. Like, if I would prefer string to not implement any interfaces. <laughs> okay, in any collection interfaces. Good luck. You can fork. <laughs> uh, well, we used to have a string that did not implement any collection interfaces. Where did we have to used to have it? In system runtime, that 1.0. Then there was a revolt or something. And then there was a revolt. Reaction to that same? Good. Is there any ton of value for that cares? I don't understand. What? I'm not convinced the interface is adding a ton of value for that. For code that cares. Yeah. Oh, for code. Oh. Or I should say for customer value. I guess in this case, it should be called. All right. I guess. All right. So, Asun, we move the span extensions as vector to future. OK. Are you OK with it? Yeah. Um, bottom one. Span. No, no, bottom one. Why That's span extension as well? Because we, don't we, just, we just talked about this. We just pushed it off. The competition was pretty forward. Yeah. But oh, still, I it's, it's work and. Okay. It's just a convenience method. And it's because we want to do more it discussion about API or. He basically just said, like, okay, he doesn't think that it's adding some of it. But as vector? Yeah. No, no, it adds value. It's just we are running out of time. Is you don't want to do it now. But then let's do the API review now. Like, you know, we have time. Oh, you mean simple. the API? Yeah, we can, we can yeah. review the API, right? I mean, you don't have to implement it, right? No. Okay. No, we oh, you, <laughs> you have to implement it. Like, that's the whole point. All right, so then. Uh, oh, God. Really? Oh yeah, and now I need to do some thinking. Um, so this would only return the first, the, the number of elements that would actually fit into the vector one. No, it needs to actually, um, it needs to match, I, I, I think. Um, so in that case, maybe the if check, but the implementation doesn't matter. You say it needs to be a multiple of vector count? I think so. How do you implement the API, by the way? Like the implementation is uh, there in the proposal. It's both an API proposal and an implementation proposal. <laughs> it's just basically the oh, syntax that's not, you know, like it's basically every time I want to write it, I have to go and search for the existing code that, that does this. That does this. Because yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, that to me points to a different API though. There are like three calls to unsafe APIs. Oh, but then Ben said that we don't need to read that unaligned. Hmm. Okay. And his rationale is because x86 doesn't care, most likely. 
Sure, but we support more than x86. Yeah. The thing is, there are, there are actually two different intrinsic instructions for reading unaligned and aligned vectors. I forgot. I think vector of t is, I think, if it's living on the stack, it's always aligned or something like that. I don't know what we do when we return from functions. Well, what's the scenario for this? So basically, the vector of t is a single register, right? Yeah. So effectively, you are, we already have APIs that allow you to load a single register right from memory meaning a pointer, right? and this is basically the same thing for a slice. It is a bit weird, but it's not entirely weird, because basically, so the, so the question is, yeah, you know, okay, already, like basically slice has to be exactly the size of the single register. So another API that we should consider is it takes a span of t and it returns a a span of vector of t. What? Which one? Oh. I think we had some APS. So basically, it takes span of t. Yes. And it returns span of vector of t. Oh, that it's kind of vectorized. Basically? And the span that it returns is uh, like it basically it takes the span of t. Let's say it's five million. Yes. And it would create, yeah. you know, one billion vectors plus some slack that then you have to manually, like, deal with. I think this is how our code is actually implemented. This is a building block for the actual API that you... Do we have that API, are you sure? It's we don't have an API. Have like, in the implementation, we keep writing this code that basically every time you write, you have to, like, look up how, you know, we wrote it. Like, span, span of byte dot get index of uses this under the cover. Yeah, so we, when we designed Vector of T, we talked about adding that API, and we never did because we didn't have consuming code. Now that we have consuming code, we should totally design that API. Well, I think the, the other reason is that uh, initially there was no <laughs> non-allocating way to create a collection of something. So you couldn't have this API because, you know, let's say you have a, a byte array or array of some things. If you want to return a collection of vectors, what is the representation of the collection? It would allocate. Now that we have a span, we basically just reinterpret. Like there's no reason. No, we cannot. We cannot. We cannot just well, reinterpret. It has to load because because. It, in span, we have a length. The, the thing yeah. is, though, like, how does this deal with alignment? Because not only do we have to worry about the multiples of vector count, we also worry about alignment in some of our API implementations. And if you haven't pinned the span, it could go out of alignment on the next GC. Yeah, I, I don't, now don't remember. I talked with somebody, like, what the implications are of so before we go to NetHab, let's just talk about this API. So we have a, in, in another API today. We have a constructor on vector of t that takes an array and an array and an offset. Any reason it's not a constructor? On what type? It's vector of t. Or this on the constructor of vector of t? Because we already have a constructor of vector of t, but the only thing that you can do it right now is t and t array. Yeah, it could be. Like t, t span? Yeah. And it was the same semantics as stick. Oh, let me think about it. Can we do that? Where, is vector, where does vector live? Dependencies and things, is it, you know, because it's... Well, a, this one has more time, right? We can totally change the rest of the, for the thing with it. If you, I mean, this is an API that doesn't even ship yet, so like, we can point it everyone and put it. Actually, no, you're right. We're already sprinkling BCL with dependencies, yeah. so whatever, uh, yeah, I'll shut up. I mean, span will live lower than vector of t, let's put it that way. Span will live lower than vector of t does today, so it will be fine. I think it's the most natural API, rather than this. Oh, I think I... No, 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 I now remember, okay. Sorry, it's becoming, so you, you see, I, I filed it on September 29th, I already don't remember. So Eric Melino's comment is a good comment. Um, it, bas it basically is the best way to do it. So, I think the API as designed now, or as I proposed, 
copies the data. It tells us. Well, right. it technically has it to. It takes the data from the span and creates a vector and mm -hmm. copies the data into the vector. What Eric is proposing is a non, uh, no copy. It's just a, a reinterpret cast. But whatever you want to do an operational, then it needs to be pumped into a register anyway. Exactly. Right? So like it's not a copy. It's a load in a register. That's what it is. Assuming JIT can skip well, that one loading. No, 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 no. The, the API as I proposed is first you, you copy data from span to vector, and then when you want to do the end operation, like a vectorized operation, you have to copy to a vector. No, so I, I actually have code like this, and I looked through the code gem, yes. and uh, the jitter is smart enough just to move the data directly into a register. Yeah, this is, like this code here, I mean, ignoring your flow, but like this part here, effectively becomes a whatever the single register load instruction is. Yeah. It becomes Actually, a single instruction. And that is also why these like these guys here, like this constructor here, is the same thing. You're basically it's a it's a load for a managed pointer. Mm, okay. Okay. So that's then why yes. I think I think what he's let's just add the constructor. I think what he's proposing, he's proposing is also available yes. because that's the that's, yeah, the, yeah. that's the chunking. But the, the, the other API you propose is the building block for that. Correct. Okay, let's let's just add the constructor instead of the API that yes. I proposed. And then the API that Eric proposes, we should do it, but separately. Yes. I, I'll try to file an issue for it. Like so that would be... So the only reason why we... I don't, forgot what this... The, I mean, technically, that's the same. Yeah, the chunking would be interesting because you really, as, as you mentioned, the alignment might play a role as well. So you might have something at the beginning, then chunks, and then something at the end, right? Well, what, what do you mean something at the beginning, then yeah. chunks? If you want to have it aligned. But the thing is, the GC is free to move that span around in memory if it points to a heap object. And it's, it's guaranteed that it will never get unaligned with respect to the natural work size, but vectors are 256 bits. Well, that's what. Well, but at the time when you call the API, it can determine how much slack it needs in front and back, right? It but can this check the alignment at runtime. Yes, but what what does that get you? What do you mean? What? what this way you can process the bytes that are unaligned first, then process the. But if if you haven't pinned the span at the time that you perform the check. And then your next line starts executing a GC could have kicked in yeah. and moved the span around and anyway. Encapsulated it in pins. Yeah. You have, like if you if you want to point to if, if you want to pull memory and treat it as an aligned vector, you absolutely have to pin. You can't work around it. It needs more talk. Maybe it's not possible. Yeah. Like look at the UTF eight code that I've been writing. I I work around this in several places there where I do vectorization. Right. It's collectible. It's on the top. Yeah, the one will be longer. Is there such a thing as a collectible tile? I think we only have collectible assemblies. You do. Okay. Is there a or a question? You do. If you don't thing? have it to the full extent, so you can load random stuff, but you can reform it collectible assembly in .NET Framework. That's what I'm sense. saying. I think we have collectible assemblies. I don't think there's such a thing as collectible types. Oh. Which is why I find this API somewhat I mean, you could technically say it's a type containing a collectible assembly, but it seems... Well, I'm not sure what this thing does, from what... Type is like, can you go from the type to the assembly and ask the assembly whether it's collectible? It seems a more natural way. Uh, so... No, there's no collectible all API. Wait, what? So I'm showing type dot is collectible already exists. Well, that may be because of our indexing. It's just not amazing. Yeah, indexing, I think, like this. Okay. Nope, I don't have that type. Where do you see that? Uh, source 
dot 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 dot. Uh, that might be looking at the wrong. That's way. maybe why he's proposing an API because it already exists in the implementation. Well, because he edited it 22 hours ago. <laughs> so what does the implementation do? Well, well that, that would propagate into your set thing this quickly, would it? Sorry? Will propagate so quickly from course Well, you probably did implementation, but index reference is this, right? So which is why it's not exposed yet. It's it's only in the implementation. But it's very shortly, so. Well, what does this implementation do? Does it just do return assembly blah, or does it? You're asking hard questions right now. Well, you're looking at the code, didn't you? Like, no, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm looking at the metadata. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> uh, returns true. What the heck? <laughs> it does. It's yeah. Well, okay. well Jan approved, so there must be some truth to it. But what the heck? Okay, I'm really. Yeah, let's not go into that. Why did the heck? Treating cache success in as other expressions. Spell the word um, We do. We have collectible methods. Um, well, that's dynamic, dynamic method. Yeah, yeah, that's slightly. LCG, which is uh, well, actually, they are on fake types. Oh, sure, and those I, are collectible. So I think I know why, because it depends on the context. Load context is a property of a type, not of a set. Let's ask Jan, why do we need that here? Right. There's 10 minutes left, we might actually go into this today. You want anyone understand syndication feed formatter? Um, my key level is close to zero given that this whole API lives in WCF. But I would say, generally speaking, something that takes a constructed generic like this is not a great API. Hmm. Well, what's already on that type? Maybe it's, maybe it's consistent with the type already has. Syndication, feed, format. The daytime person. That's a weird app, yeah. Really weird. They don't mind just telling Mitch what design, like, <laughs> it's like he ever found with eight arguments. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? Uh, one, two, three, four. Yeah, three arguments on the time time. That seems a bit excessive. Four I'm on after it. Well, so WCF does use delegate patterns in quite a few places. I don't think this is actually. Out okay. of the question, given their existing programming model. Well, I'm just looking at syndication feed format. I don't see anything that takes returns or produces funds. Oh, on, on that type itself, you mean? Oh, you know what they're doing? I think I know what the problem is. So if you look at the API here, yeah. they, I think they try to be, well, you can't quite see it here, but basically I think what they do, what they try to do is they, they try to, well, not this one here, um, this one, I think they try to formalize that API. Or something to that extent. Mm. Or do they know? Like the API signature that he's proposing is different, right? It's like, <laughs> what was that? String, string, string. No, I don't think that's what he's doing. What if we ask them next time to join us? 
Let me just reply. Any reason this cat being named? We, we might want to pull cat. Bounded concurrent Q. Hmm? Okay, that's Stephen again using a ton of English words that I don't understand. Um, <laughs> it's an unbounded, let's say, Q with a primary operation sign in Q. Try the Q. Yep. Oh, I see what he's saying. So he wants to have a max size on it. Yeah, a fixed size. So is there any reason why this wouldn't be just an API on the existing type? Is does concurrent queue even have a try in queue method or is it just in queue by itself? I think it's just in queue by itself. No, yeah. that makes the existing API uh, not usable for this scenario unless you have it throw, but you don't really want it to throw. Well, you couldn't do overloads, right? No, but then you have basically a type that is in a weird mode, right? Yeah, like you, like the only one set of APIs is valid. You have tried DQ. Yeah, concurrent queue exposes in queue rather than try in queue. Yeah. yeah, Stephen mentions it already in the post. Oh, yep. Yeah, I right. make it in a new type is probably a better idea because it does have different behaviors. Than concurrent queue. Well, it's as well implementation detail of our current. I would say it's generally useful to have a new type when you effectively establish a family of of APIs that are that have to be used mutually exclusively from other APIs in the same type, in which case you should really have two different types. And, and that seems like it's kind of the territory, right? Because there's only one set of overloads that you that you should be using, because the other ones are ill-defined. Well, let's turn this around. Ignore concurrent queue. If we were to put a cap on list of T, what would it look like? Would we have a try add method instead of just add? It would just throw when you reach that. It would say you construct the list of T, and then the behavior of the other method just falls out, but they just fail once you read the cap. But then that makes add slower, right? Because you have to do that check every time. So they wouldn't make. So you would yeah. penalize everybody who's using list of t. Yeah. Um, well, list of t dot add is guaranteed never to throw. But as, 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 like as an example, you pay. The well, except when you run out of memory, but yes. But you uh, pay the cost of uh, performance, right? For yeah, everybody. Pay, yeah. Yeah. pay panel. Yeah, you pay. You basically now everybody has to do the check. Um, and and introduce yeah. the behaviors. And given that concurrent queue is by definition you you can't do the check before you call in queue. Like, there's no way. Like, you, you always have to be prepared for in queue to throw if we use the same type. That is true, although, so you're arguing that you cannot really use this thing in place for existing code. Like yeah. Existing code can never handle that thing. That may be true, um, although I'm not sure that that's by itself would be strong enough reason not to change the type in that, in that sense. Um, But yeah, like I, what I don't like about types that have modes is that it basically makes documentation virtually impossible. Like yeah. you have to like have a state machine and you have not used to type, which, which I agree with Stephen points more towards let's have a new type that has that behavior. Um, 
Yeah, we should do a more holistic review on that one. I think the um, just talking about this in isolation, I think, helps. All right, I think we're out of time, but we went through almost all of it, which is. Did you approve this one, or did you? No, I asked the question here. I think this one needs more talking, and this one I asked the question. Yeah. What more talking? We have still five minutes. Okay. Well, I want Stephen to be on the call for the starter. That's not gonna happen for and until the end of January. Which is fine. I don't think this API is uh -huh. really like critical for anybody. Like from what he wrote, it's like it would yeah. be a nice API to have. Yeah. So, yeah. Be nice to have you here too. All right. I would say thanks online. And as soon as I find the pause button, I can actually stop cleaning. All right. Bye-bye, guys.